So it's connecting to point six. All right, so welcome back to Math 12, the Mathematics of Lego. This is the second attempt to do a Zoom recording and a Zoom share. So I've been teaching this class continuously since around, I think, 2011, except for the first year of the pandemic. If you are not able to make a class for any reason, I will try to have all of the lectures recorded and all the slides available later the same day. There are a lot of different ways we can take this class, depending on what you're interested in. You know, we have lots of different avenues. Um, one of the annoying things is that the first week of winter study coincides with the big joint math meetings, which as a mathematician I need to go to, especially since it's in Boston this year. So they're rolling the die that the weather will be okay and people will be able to travel to and from. So by later this week, I will not be in town. So we'll be meeting Tuesday and Wednesday, and then you'll have a couple of days to be thinking about and researching what you want to do. And then we'll start you know, full force the next week. Okay, if you have any questions at any time, you know, please feel free to speak up. Um, I would like to get to know you. If you do not want to get to know me, that is absolutely fine. I understand what a winter study is like. If people want to get together for coffee or breakfast tomorrow or at some point, you're happy to try to find your know, times that will work and I'll send out some information afterwards. I'll stay around for a little bit. If anybody wants, I have brought some chocolates. You're welcome to grab some so that if you are eating, of course, you can't be doing other things. Um, okay. So let's see if the slides work. Okay, so the main goals for the class is there is, um, I'm not sure how familiar people are with Lego. Is there anybody here who has never played with Lego? Or if you don't like the word play, learned with Lego or whatever you want to say. Okay, excellent. So there's a wonderful opportunity called a Lego idea challenge. If you can create something and get 10,000 people to support it online, there is a chance that Lego will convert that to a set. You know, I have a couple of things on my bucket list. Having a constructed Lego set is one of them. It would be wonderful if we were able to get that. Uh, we've tried a little bit in previous years. We've never had enough drive to you know, pull it across the finish line. It really has to look professional. It has to be really good. Uh, I think I have a good idea for this year, which I'll talk about in greater detail. In previous years, we've done some Lego bridges for MLK Day. We've done some speed build challenges. We've done you know, Rubik's Cube attempt, and I'll talk a little bit about that. This year, I wanna to try to focus on games. You know, I think there's a real opportunity to build a Lego game set that we might be able to get to 10,000 followers on. We also, um, in previous years, have done a lot of outreach with younger kids. So the Williamstown Elementary School has a program in January where three or four times, you know, once a week, uh, for three or four weeks, Typically college students, sometimes members of the community come down to the elementary school and for about an hour and a half work with the kids there on something fun. And so, you know, Lego is a fun thing to do with little kids and I wanna get them involved. And I'll talk a little bit about my thoughts on what to do with them, assuming I can believe the shipping estimates are true from the Lego Corporation. Uh, another possibility if people are interested is writing a book on the mathematics of Lego. There's a lot of great things you can do on that not just on the pure math side on combinatorics, but if you're interested in a more applied career, such as you know, financing or marketing, there's a lot of great stories that you can talk about there. So if anybody's interested in stuff like this, let me know. You know again, today, I'm just trying to give you a sense of what's out there. Uh, qualifications, I know math, I know Lego, I have worked with these you know, for many years. I am caught up on the Lego, um, you know, TV series, the Lego movies, you know, I've seen them all, uh, except for, you know, some of the different cartoons. And, you know, the goal is to try to find a fun way to learn some math. So I really want to use Lego as a springboard to talk about some fun things. Out of curiosity, how many people are a science major of some type? Okay, how many people are a math major? All right, economics. Okay, who have I not called? Is it two people? Oh, okay, and your majors? Political science, anthropology, okay. So we'll see um, connections between you know, a lot of these different fields. I think we can easily get to anthropology. Political science um, might be a little bit harder, but there are some very interesting questions in terms of how Legos are marketed and you know, which sets are done that might, you know, fit into that. All right, so just you're part of my qualifications. There were three things I negotiated for in my wedding. One of them was I got to build the top of the wedding cake. Uh, the 
people are uh, twisties, but the base is actually Lego. It was originally from a Lego enterprise that I built as a kid, and it was painful to destroy the enterprise for that, but some sacrifices have to be made in life. All right. Uh, can anybody tell me what this is? Yes. You need to be more specific. That's good. Uh, here's, here's a better version in the right colors. Yeah. It is the enterprise. Okay. We can remedy that. So we can have a great conversation about Star Wars versus Star Trek. Years ago, I actually bought a Jar Jar and gave it to the student who had the best proposal on how to destroy it. So uh, this was done in under 10 pieces. So you know, sometimes you know, an interesting challenge is when you only have limited resources, what can you do and still capture the main idea? I don't know, have anybody here watched any of these you know, challenge shows, you know, the cooking shows or the fashion shows? Okay. A better question might be, uh, some people don't want to admit it. How many people know somebody who watches a show like that? And you might get more people if you go like that, right? And so you know, sometimes they give you a very strange set of ingredients to use. What can you make with that? And so for your Lego challenges or whatnot, if you have in Lego masses a huge bucket of you know, every piece known to humanity, there's a lot you can do. What can you do if you don't have great pieces? When I was a kid, the Lego sets were crappy. Out of curiosity, how many people have a Lego set purchased in the last 10 years? Okay, not as many as I thought, okay. The, the sets now are phenomenal. Yeah, they look wonderful. And I think there's less of a desire to break them down, destroy them and rebuild. When I was a kid, the sets were, I gotta be careful because this is being recorded. The sets were not as beautiful as they are today. You know, there weren't as many special pieces. You had to be very creative. You had to figure out how can I do what I want with the pieces that I have and not just say, let's make a new piece that has studs on both sides. And so it really forced you to be creative and find ways to solve problems. And I think a lot of my science uh, success came from solving a variety of problems like that. And so challenges like this, if I only give you a small number of pieces, or when I do Lego sets with my kids, we often have a challenge. Let's try to build a Starfleet ship from you know, one of the Lego friends set bags or one of the Atari bags or something like that and see how well can you do with just pieces like that. All right, so for the first week, I wanna spend it on doing introductions, talking a little bit about the various subjects and discussing what we might wanna do. Somewhat quickly, we need to figure out what we're doing so we can start purchasing blocks. You know, the Williams budget is very, very finite. I'm willing to supplement it, but the real issue is shipping. And it takes time for pieces to get to us. Now we can do a lot of construction online with your know, virtual you know, 3D Lego set creators. It's not the same as actually having, I think the pieces in front of you and just being able to play and experiment. So it is better to overestimate and buy more than we need so that you have stuff to play with than to not have the stuff in front of you. So we will make wish lists somewhat soon and I will start putting in orders. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna go through too much details. Uh, you can look at the slides later. These are some slides of what we did when we did a speed build in previous years, you know, trying to build the 3,152 piece superstar destroy in under 10 minutes. And so the first year we just barely missed because the very last thing that had to be put on to keep some of the wings from flying off was built back. You know, we had it, but at the last minute we had to rebuild that and we went over 10 minutes. So we opened up another box. And one of the people, one, one of the groups building one of the long wings dropped it. And they had a very difficult decision to make. Do they destroy what they had already done, go back to scratch, or do they try to fix what they dropped? And they decided to try to fix what they dropped, which was a mistake. They were off by one row. And we ended up being over 11 minutes by the time they finished. The next year we got it. Um, we had 40 students the first year, we had about 60 the next year, plus a lot of elementary school kids. It was a really great exercise in terms of trying to figure out how do you assign sub projects? How do you have a command structure and get things done on time? 
We had some elementary school kids who were not as fast as the college kids, not a problem. If they're building something that we don't need before seven or eight minutes, if they take more time than college students, that's fine. We had so many people, we had one person whose job was when we opened up a certain bag to look for a special piece that was hard to find. That was their job because we needed that piece at a certain moment. We completely changed the order of building many sections of the Superstar Destroyer. Because when you're doing a speed build with lots of people, that's very different than building it as one person. So there was a lot to be learned from stuff like this. If anyone is interested, I'm happy to talk about some of the lessons learned. One of the more interesting ones was the difficulty some students had building in public. So we built this in Pereski with the campus watching. And a lot of people were nervous. And they made mistakes that they didn't normally make. Interestingly, there seemed to be a split between the athletes and the non-athletes in terms of how building in public was experienced. You know, the athletes were more game on, more experienced in doing something like that. You know, in life, you are often going to be in a position where people are looking at what you're doing. It's good to try to get to the point where you're comfortable having eyes on you. So there's a lot that can be learned from something like that. Uh, other big lesson to learn is the known unknowns, the things that you think might cause problems and just have some strategies. What's my contingency plan if this goes wrong? And you know, when you're building things, do some mistakes, deliberately have some things go wrong. Uh, in the space program, you know, they had people whose job it was, was to design the most painful complications possible in the Apollo program and just hit the astronauts with these. And the idea is let's hit you with this while you're training in mission control. And so if something like this happens to you when you're out in space, you're gonna be okay. A day or two before Apollo 11, the first uh, manned mission that landed on the moon launched, they hit them with something that they had never experienced before. You know, some multiple computer failures and whatnot. And in the simulation, it crashed. And they talked about it and something very similar to that actually happened two days later when they were trying to land and they realized, oh, okay, this just means the computer is getting too much information. The computers back then are not as powerful as our cell phones. We can ignore that. It's okay. And so again, general advice in life, if there are certain things that might go wrong, try to think about what they might be. Try to think in advance, what kind of strategies would you have for something like this? What kind of plan B, plan C can you have in reserve so that if something goes wrong, you're okay? So you mentioned you are a Star Wars fan. So if you keep a straight face, it's amazing what you can get away with. So I had a student years ago who was a computer science major. Uh, she was very into computer graphics. She had never seen Star Wars. And I told her, you can't graduate Williams you know, with a CS interested in graphics without seeing the original Star Wars movie. That's just, you, you need to know that. She says, okay. So I made it a campus event. You know, I brought in pizza, I brought in the movie. We started playing halfway through, the DVD stopped working and I couldn't get the DVD to work. What did I do? I'm sorry? Nope, nope. I had a backup plan, I had a plan B. What's my plan B when the DVD doesn't work? This is before streaming video. Very close, I had a second DVD on me. And when she was surprised when I pulled this out, she said, you had a second DVD and I said, if necessary, we're watching it on VHS today. You don't have yourself in a situation where if one thing goes wrong, you're screwed if you can possibly avoid it. So if you're doing a big event like this, you make sure, do I have a backup plan? What happens if things don't work? If possible, ideally, you come down to the place, you try it beforehand, you make sure everything works. So we've done a lot of speed builds in the past, and there's a lot of really good life lessons that you can learn from that. You know, we're not gonna do almost surely a speed build this year. People really want to do that, happy to change and do a speed build. There's a lot that you can learn from that. But just trying to put some of these things on your radar. This is one of the things I love about winter study. It's a chance to learn things that you don't see in a standard classroom. All right. So I talked about the elementary school. If people want to watch any of the Lego movies, I believe I have all of them. If not, I'm happy to quickly get them. Uh, you know, some of them are you know extremely interesting in terms of how they integrate the special effects with the stories. Okay. So prereqs, I'm assuming everybody has taken at least algebra one and two. 
Okay, if you've taken more math, more math is never bad, but as long as you're comfortable with basic algebra, that's fine. Uh, you must come to class. If you're not able to come to class, you know, please let me know. Usually uh, for stuff like this, the grading is done by some kind of small paper and just you know, observing what you do here. There is no longer the option of having a high pass. So the first year we just barely failed in making the superstar destroy in under 10 minutes. So I told the students in year two, if everybody contributes and we get it done in under 10 minutes, everybody gets a high pass. If not, everybody gets a fail. And for the rest of your life, you're going to have to explain to people why you failed a class called basically playing with Lego. So we set the record for most high passes ever given in a winter study at Williams College with over 60. Does anybody know why Williams no longer has a high pass? I know it was not because I gave too many in the class. When there are four different grade levels, high pass, pass, perfunctory pass, and fail, this is now translated into your GPA when you're applying to some schools like law school. And so a pass is translated as a non-A grade. And it was actually impacting some students in application. So because of that, we no longer have the high pass. You always want to get a sense of why do people do things the way they do? Anybody take any humanities classes here? What's the cap in a lot of humanities classes? Anybody know? I believe a lot of these classes are capped at 19. Anybody know why? Yes. Nope. I don't know either. In a completely unrelated, in a completely unrelated topic, anybody ever look at US News and World Report and college rankings? Anybody know what's considered a small class? I believe under 20, completely unrelated topic. So always think about where do things come from? Can anybody tell me where the word QWERTY comes from? Keyboard. Why do keyboards start off Q-W-E-R-T-Y? But, but why, why do we have the letters like that? So say, say it louder. Okay, so you think it's done by usage to make it easy for you? No. Good guess. If it, if it was a logical world, yes, but no. It's done to make you type slow. It goes back to the days of typewriters. And Lego has a beautiful Lego typewriter set where if you hit two keys close to each other in quick succession, there was a danger of when the things come down to press on the paper of them locking together. So the QWERTY keyboard is designed to slow you down when you type. This is the 21st century. Has anybody here actually used a typewriter? I haven't used one really since high school. Why do we still use a QWERTY keyboard? People are used to it. Which people? Old people, right? Like myself. You know, if we really cared about you, we would take the hit. And we would learn something new rather than forcing each succeeding generation to keep learning the same stupid old system. I'm going to be very careful because this is being recorded, right? You know, really, the old people should take the hit. Now, in a few years, it's wait, you used to type on a keyboard? If you've ever seen Star Trek IV, there's a beautiful scene when Scotty is uh, back in the 20, 20th century. And He's given a mouse and he thinks, oh, you speak into the mouse and the computer types for you. Oh, you have a keyboard, how quaint. How many people have some kind of audio system transcribe what they're doing now? For like an email or a text message, at least part of the time do you use some kind of transcribing service? Well, I'm surprised. Okay, not that many. 
But always think about why things are the way they are. What kind of statistics are we looking at? What kind of quantities are we looking at? And that's something I want to talk a little bit about using Lego as a springboard of you know, things that go around in the world. OK. So uh, you know, years ago, my kids and I built a working Lego Rubik's Cube. You can click on the link and see how it goes. It's not good. It works, but it's not good. Uh, someone else has done a phenomenal one of you know, a essentially real size Lego Rubik's Cube that works. It's gotten 10,000 followers on the Lego ideas. And I hope that this is a set that they make. It's absolutely brilliant how they done how they did it. And you can see the details of their construction. All right. So one of the things I want to talk about leading into the math of Lego is unit analysis. Does anybody know what bridge this is? Yeah, very good. Excellent, right? Anybody know why this bridge is famous? So we don't have fraternities anymore at Williams. It's a fascinating story how fraternities came to this institution. But when you are pledging a fraternity, there's a lot of things you can have your pledges do. And one day, someone was pledging one of the fraternities at MIT, and they were curious, how many times would it take us to pick you up, put you down, pick you up, put you down, to get from one end of the bridge to the other? And so they saw it took 364.1 smooths plus or minus an ear. And every time they put him down, they put a little mark on the bridge, and then they kept doing this until they got to the end. Well, the city of Cambridge wasn't amused, and they had it painted over. The fraternity wasn't amused, so they did it again. And eventually the city said, ah, to hell with it. And then over time, it's become part of the local flavor. Is this a good unit of measurement? The smoot. No. No. Why is this a bad unit of measurement? It's not standardized. It's not standardized. And you, God forbid, you want to have your own smoot. You know, how do you compare and make sure that your smoot is the standard smoot? What happens if smoot grows or shrinks? You know, there's a lot of issues with this. As a fun twist, it's now become so embraced that they actually have official smoot markers on the bridge. And if there's an accident, the police report says at what smoot did the accident happen? So. One of the pieces of advice I give all of my students is seize opportunities you never know where they will lead. So this is Smoot many years later. This was the person who was used as the unit of measurement. Has anybody ever heard of Smoot? One of his cousins was in a Big Bang episode, or at least mentioned in a Big Bang episode. I think he was actually in the episode. You can't make this stuff up. He became the chairman of the American National Standards Institute and president of the International Organization for Standardization. I can just see the interviews. Well, I, I don't want to brag or anything, but qualifications, I am a unit of measurement. You could be very upset when something like this is happening to you, or you could roll with the punch and think, how can I distinguish myself? You know, one of my favorite quotes is, you're one in a million, which means there's a thousand like you in China. Or you could say, or oh, in India. There's a lot of people who are going to be very similar to you. There's a lot of people who are going to be smart. How can you distinguish yourself from others? What can you do when you're having interviews for jobs? How can you stand out? And that's something I really want you to be thinking about so that you can take it to the next level. We're very fortunate, Williams. We have one of the oldest, I think we have the oldest alumni network. We have wonderful opportunities through something like that. The first winter study class I ever taught was on the mathematics of encryption. And I encrypted the title. And the registrar's office, wait, do you really want to <laughs> as the official title of the course? Goes, yes. And several students told me when they were interviewing for jobs, it was a conversational start. They said, you know, we saw your transcript. What is this class? So again, think about what can you do to shine? What can you do to get noticed? There's so many similarly trained people. You want to find a way to shine. Okay. So we all agree the smooch is not a good statistic. Can anybody give me what might be a good statistic for a Lego set? What kind of quantities? Yes. Study. study. What does that mean? Okay, but I'm talking about for Lego sets. So I give you a Lego set. What kind of quantities do I want to look at to describe the Lego set? Piece count. What else? 
what age is it appropriate for? I sometimes disagree with you. What else? Difficulty, which should be related to age. What else? So when, you, when you're looking at Lego sets, the only thing you care about is piece count? So you might care about minifigures. Oops, that's someone else. What else might you care about? Okay, you might care about size. Yo, the size matters. Uh, Yoda is correct. Oh no, no, Yoda's wrong. Um, there were negotiations. So when we did the Superstar Destroyer Challenge, um, I did have to promise that it would not be stored in my house at the end of the day. So it's in my office. Actually, there's four of them on campus. One of them is in my office. But there's a really obvious quantity associated to a Lego set that nobody has mentioned yet. Not weight. The only thing you've really mentioned is you know, age and piece count. When you're looking at a Lego set, and trying to decide, do I want to get this? Not volume. Price. Is there anybody here who's majoring in economics? All right. The fact that you did not send me price, cost, something like that, shame on you. Or you are in a situation where price does not matter to you, in which case, let's talk after class. Right? So you know, there were some Lego sets that I've seen that are like, you know, this is really interesting, but for this cost, it's just not worth it. So cost per piece is actually a pretty good statistic. So I'm also teaching another winter study um, related to the math of sports. And I'm teaching a class on the math of sports in the, in the fall, I'm sorry, in the spring. And a lot of it is about trying to find what is a good statistic. So cost per piece is not a bad statistic. Uh, one other thing related to you said piece count might be piece complexity or piece choices. I don't know if I included the Lego Tower Bridge. It's one of the biggest sets with one of the lowest cost per pieces. You know, it's the London Tower. I know we have some people visiting from across the pond. It's a wonderful set. It's in my office, but so many of the pieces are, you know, little brown uh, brick. And it's just not that exciting in terms of the pieces that you get. So you know, here, and these numbers are from a couple of years ago. Uh, this is one of the X-Wings. They keep changing the color of the X-Wings so that they can sell new sets. So this was the red one. It was 560 pieces for $120, or about 21 cents per piece. You know, here is one of the Lego Friends sets, the Frozen Castle. Anybody know the connection between Williams College and Frozen? It was a husband-wife team that wrote the songs and lyrics and the wife went to Williams. So it's 292 pieces for $65, or, you know, 22 cents per piece. And so it's interesting to see as you go across lots of different sets, do you have you know, pretty similar cost per pieces? And which sets are different? Oh, I do have the Lego uh, London Bridge, excellent. So the Superstar Destroyer, um, I mean, they don't make the original one anymore. So Legos are a very interesting investment. The only other thing that might be as good of an investment would be stamps. You know, if you buy the forever stamps, the way prices for postage goes up, a uh, pretty good deal. So the London Bridge, back when I did this, was $240 for 4,295 pieces, about 5.6 cents per piece, you know, way out of line with a lot of other sets. Because you know, so many of the pieces are just the same little thing, not that many exciting pieces. And so it's always interesting to look at you know, extremes and anomalies. Uh, Millennium Falcon in terms of investment opportunities. When my brother got married, uh, a couple of his friends chipped in and for $500, they bought him the Millennium Falcon. Uh, he sadly opened it up and built it. He didn't keep it in the box. But you know, at one point when I was doing this class years ago, if you had an original Falcon in an unopened box, it was selling for $6,000. So you know, for people who are looking for avenues to go with this course, Legos as a form of investment is an interesting possibility. All right, uh, I'm not going to go too much into Lego ideas. Um, you know, here's just you know a few of them. You know, I'm an old you know 70s 80s guy, so the old Buck Rogers was interesting to me. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of the 2018 Lego team, but just briefly, 
they plotted a bunch of you know, sets and looking at the price per piece. And you see a very interesting relationship that it's approximately linear for most sets. And there's a few sets that are, whoops, anomalies. And you, you can see one of the biggest anomalies is the London Tower Bridge in terms of just how different it is. But you can see going across many scales from you know, Lego City Square to a Disney Council to a Death Star, it's pretty much a constant line. All right, so I'm gonna skip that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we can do with Lego and science. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. You can look at the slides and let me know what are you interested in. I'm just you know, quickly doing this so that you can always pause. Uh, does anybody notice anything interesting about the axes? Is this normally how you would label your axes? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's powers of 10. So what we're really doing is we're really plotting, it's a log log plot. So a lot of relationships are not linear. Straight lines are probably the easiest function for us to understand. You know, Y equals MX plus B or AX plus B, depending on how you learned it. A lot of relationships that are not linear become linear when you do a log log plot or sometimes the semi-log plot where you take the log of one of the variables and not the other. And so over here, this is just you know, optimal cruise speed at sea levels versus mass. And it's a bunch of different uh, flying objects, including some artificial ones like the 777. And you can see again, this beautiful linear relationship. Um, your here is you know, Lego and science piece complexity. So on the left, it's a log log plot. The X axis is the log of the number of Lego pieces. And the Y axis is the number of piece types. So what can you tell me when you look at this? As the number of pieces in the set grows, what typically happens? So as your set gets larger and has more and more pieces, what does the Y axis tell you is happening? Well, what do you mean by the pieces are becoming more and more complicated? Yeah. There are more types of pieces. That as your set becomes bigger, you have more different types of pieces coming in. It would be interesting to look at the counts of the different complexity types. You know, how often when we have you know, so many pieces, do we only have one or two copies of this new special piece that we need just for this one little thing? It might be interesting to look at you know, how involved is it. But not surprisingly, as the set becomes more complex, you have more complex ingredients coming in. And you can see this very similarly with you know, natural life forms in terms of as the life form becomes more complex, the more different types of internal structures do you have. And again, you can look at a lot of these in greater detail um, you know, if you're interested. You could also do a lot of different things about you know, counting. Do we have any chemistry majors here? Okay, so one chemistry major, okay, excellent. How many people have ever played tic-tac-toe? Or what is it called in England? Drops and knots or? Uh, yeah, yeah. What's it called? Yeah. Knots and crosses, okay. I had drops and knots, I was supposed okay. So I am actually the reigning elementary school champion in tic-tac-toe, I have never been defeated. I've been tied occasionally. So tic-tac-toe is a very winnable game. Can somebody tell me how many opening moves there are in tic-tac-toe? Nine, how many responses? How many responses to the responses? All right, so this is a lot. Just the, if you look at the first move, nine times eight is 72. That's a lot of possibilities. By symmetry, however, I claim that there's only a smaller number than nine possible opening moves up to symmetry. Anybody want to guess how many moves there are in tic-tac-toe up to symmetry for the opening move? Three, you can do any of the four corners. And if you rotate the board or flip the board, that's all the same. You can do the middle of each side, that's the second, or you could do the center. There's really only three opening moves. And what you can then do is you can go, well, if I move in the center, how many responses are there? Up to symmetry. Two, if you go in the corner, if you do the calculation, there's five, 
response is up to symmetry. If you go in one of the middles, there's five. There's really only 12 opening pairs of moves, much less than 72 by factor of six. And so it's actually not that hard to analyze tic-tac-toe under symmetry. Now, sometimes to show that some of the games are the same, it involves flipping the board. Well, tic-tac-toe is a two-dimensional game, typically. If you flip the board, you're rotating through three space. We can do that because we live in a three-dimensional world. We can also just view it mathematically as looking at the mirror image. If I'm analyzing tic-tac-toe, does it matter if I look at a game or its mirror image? No. If I'm dealing with chemical compounds, the effect of a compound or its mirror image can be extremely different. And so this is called chirality. And the mirror image of a compound could actually kill you where the compound could actually help you. And so when we're trying to figure out what are we counting, you have to be very careful and say, well, what am I actually studying? So when you ask, how many different structures can I make? Do you consider the mirror image of a structure the same? You know, if I have to rotate through four dimensions to get to the mirror image, I, I don't know. Um, so I'm gonna skip that. So your know, fun fact, the number of ways you can combine six two by four Lego bricks of the same color is a little bit less than a billion. But of course you have to figure out, well, what do we mean when we talk about combining them? First of all, it's pretty clear just looking at this picture that you have to put things down at right angles or 180 degrees. You can't put something down at an arbitrary angle or we would have infinitely many possibilities. What other assumptions might be made by the smiley person as they construct their... So what assumptions are either being made or what assumptions do you want to be careful not to make when you're trying to count how many ways can you combine six two by four Lego bricks of the same color? Do they have to be stacked? So one is, do they have to be stacked vertically? Do you have to have something of height six? Could you have something of height four? Is that allowed? It's unclear when you initially phrase this. What else is unclear? So one is, do we have to stack vertically? What else might be assumed? So one thing is, you know, some of these reflections and whatnot, where you can't do it in three-dimensional space, but you can do a mirror image through four dimension, does that count as something different or not? For something like this, I think they probably would count it as different. Sometimes the way we count things is we make the choice that's easier to do. How many people have taken statistics? Okay, so if you've taken statistics, you've seen the method of least squares or linear regression, and we measure errors by using sums of squares. It's much better to use sums of absolute values. But if you use sums of squares, you have the tools of calculus and linear algebra available, and you can write down in closed form, here's your best fit line. If you don't, if you use absolute values, you have to do numerical algorithms and approximations. And so it's more convenient for a lot of things to do sums of squares. So one issue is, you know, are we counting mirror images? What's another issue in terms of how we're stacking it? Again, think about what assumptions you might be making about how the bricks have to be combined. It's very hard to verbalize some of the assumptions we just implicitly make. And again, this is one of the lessons in life is stop and think about what are you subtly assuming? So we have six bricks and we wanna combine them. Your one question is, do we have to stack them vertically or could we do something else? Any other thoughts about what we might be assuming in terms of how we combine them? Yeah, the, the Legos are connected to each other. What if I just have six bricks on the table? Is that allowed? Could I have two bricks connected and then four connected? 
or two connected, three connected, and one separate. So there's nothing that says in this problem that you have to have them connected. So when you're doing something like this, really stop and think, what problem are you trying to do? A lot of times in life, when you have a problem, you make implicit assumptions about what people want that are not necessarily true. Years ago, I was doing a problem for the movie industry, trying to help theaters find optimal schedules of movies. Um, how many of you have ever read a physical newspaper other than the Williams paper or your school paper? Okay, good. So this was done about two decades ago, and we had about two hours from when we got the list of movies that were going to be played in a given week to when we had to give the company back the schedule of what time on what day on what screen to show each movie because they needed to make the deadline to the printer. And one of the constraints the owner or manager gave us was he wanted a movie to start every 20 minutes. And that was just killing us in terms of coming up with the schedule. It was taking a long time for the programs to run and it was not as uh, profitable as some other schedules. And when we told him, we believe we can increase your profits by this much if occasionally we have a 25 minute gap, his response was, oh, really? Uh, that was more of a preference, but if we can really make that much more money, absolutely fine. And so you really wanna think about what assumptions are you putting in? Do you really need them? Are there things that you're assuming that are not really true for the problem? So you know, they go through and they look at you know, just all the different ways of connecting to uh, two by two bricks. You know, already it's not so bad at this point. A lot of interesting papers where you, you try to figure out if you can't get the exact number, can you get a good approximation? Sometimes we can write down a formula that gives you the exact answer, but the formula may not be computationally tractable to use. And so it's sometimes better to use an approximation. When Elon Musk was buying Twitter, does anybody remember how much the offer was for? How much? Was it 40 or 44? I thought it was 44, 44 billion. All right. Is 4 billion out of 44 billion a lot? Billion out of 44 billion, is that a lot? Well, depending on how you look at it, it's either 1 11th or 1 10th, depending on which way you're doing it. So we're talking somewhere between nine and 10%. Is that significant? I'm gonna decrease your net worth by nine or 10%. Is that significant? I would say nine or 10% is significant. How about the US deficit? Four billion, you know, good news. The deficit is $4 billion. Uh, the total debt of the United States of America is $4 billion less than we thought. Is that really noticeable? It's a drop in the bucket. The deficit's in the trillions. And so, you know, uh, we're gonna change the Williams endowment by 4 billion. Noticeable or not noticeable? Noticeable, you know, the endowment, um, I don't know, it's around 2 billion, give or take. Oh, it's 4 billion now? We lost a lot, so three. So 4 billion would be significant. So when you're looking at numbers, you always wanna look at in context. Uh, one of my former students just emailed me a few days ago about uh, something and I was giving him ways to phrase statistics in ways that people could understand. And you know, he wrote back, a uh, statistic he had heard recently, if you take all the water on the earth and shrink it so that it now fills an Olympic pool, and you ask what fraction of that is drinkable for humans, it would be one drop. What do you think of when you hear that statistic? So one drop out of the entire pool is drinkable. Yes. You think oceans are very big? Are you concerned about there being enough drinkable water? Why not? Which is expensive, but we do have that. But if only one drop out of the whole pool, would you be concerned? Does that sound like a lot is drinkable or very little is drinkable? Very little. What if I tell you that there's a million years worth of drinkable water on the earth? And now when you shrink it down, you know that that drop actually represents a million years depending on the context you put things in, it's very different. You can easily mislead with statistics and this is something you should be aware of. One of the best phrasings I ever heard 
was of some energetic radiation. They were trying to give you a sense of how strong it is. Uh, has anybody ever been to the dentist for x-rays? What do they do when you get x-rays? Put lead on you, why? Do they just like putting lead on you? Hey, let's, let's have some fun with them. It blocks the x-rays and this is to protect your internal organs. And you know, what do the people who take the x-rays do? They leave the room. It tells you either it's dangerous or because they do it so often that you're something that's okay once or twice. You know, if you're doing it multiple times a day, every day, the effect could be bad. So this radiation was so energetic. They said, imagine you had a lead shield running from the sun to Pluto. That would not be enough to stop it. You know, that gives you a sense of just how energetic this is relative to other things you've been seeing. So whenever you're trying to convey something quantitative to people, try to find a way to phrase it so that people can understand what you're talking about. There's a wonderful book that talks about how to make statistics uh, engageable. And if anybody's interested, just let me know and I'm happy to you know, share information about that. When you see these huge, vast numbers, it's sometimes hard to really put them in context. You know, what does this mean to talk about you know, almost a billion ways of putting together just six you know, two by four bricks? That's a tremendous number of things that you can build. Most of them suck, of course. But you know, how do you get a sense or a handle on something like that? And that's just using six Lego bricks. Imagine what happens if we have a set with hundreds of pieces. The number is just mind-bogglingly large. And so um, I can't remember if this, okay, right. So this is breaking it up into, you have to have all of the pieces connected and the maximum height is two, three, four, five, or six. Why don't we look at a maximum height of one? But why not? I have six pieces. I want them to be connected. And I want the maximum, and I want the height of the object to be. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no way you can have them connected if they're just one. They'd just be touching each other, but they wouldn't be connected. And so what you can see is that the most ways of doing it is actually four, which kind of makes sense. You can go up and come down. There's lots of you know, various things you can be doing. All right. Uh, I'm not going to go into this if anybody's interested in math. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, I want to just share some of the stuff we've done in previous years before talking about what we're going to do this year. So lots of different Lego suspension bridges have been built. The following was a three-year project. So for the first year, we built our own Lego suspension bridge in Presky on the mantle. The second year, oh, that's still the mantle. The second year we built it on the floor. And the third year we actually were allowed to build it across the gap. And so we actually had students in harnesses. We worked with the Williams Outdoor Club to have them leaning over and connecting the things. No seniors were used, only freshmen were put in harnesses. Any idea why? Those seniors had job offers. Very close. You know, the seniors were about to graduate. They were about to become what's called either alumni or donors, depending on how you want to pronounce the word. Okay. And so, you know, we didn't want to risk, you know, harming anything like that. But so, you know, we were able to, you know, build this across, and it's you know, fascinating just seeing, you know, how much the bridge sagged and whatnot. Only Lego were used for that. Right. There's a lot of different mathematical topics we can do. I will let you look at these. And you can tell me what you want to see. I'm not sure if I pause on that side long enough, so I'll go back to that. Okay. Anybody know what this is? A Lego type. How do you know it's Lego? I sent it out to you. Okay, very good. To, to me, the real difference is you've got a couple of dots over here. You know, when you look at the actual Atari, it looks really close. I mean, I, I am amazed at how good of a job they did with the system. You know, the lines over there are a little bit different than what you, you find over here, but you know, they've got knobs that work and whatnot. If people want, I'm happy to bring this into the class. This is a recent uh, Lego idea that has been built and turned into an actual product. 
and just you know, the realism that they were able to do here, building things at the right angle, having the right color and the texture, having the knobs that work. It's incredible what people are able to do nowadays. Uh, here is a Lego Nintendo system. Is anybody old enough or have a friend who's old enough to remember the games that looked like this? Okay, again, really well done. The cartridges actually go in here and you can push them down. It's extremely well done in terms of what they do. The TV is phenomenal. If you go to the website, you can click on the video. You can actually turn something and the blue screen in the background moves. It's wrapped around two cylinders. So it scrolls around like an old video game and you can move Mario up and down and pretend that you're actually playing. So incredibly well done. Uh, this is what an actual Nintendo system looks like. All right, so anybody ever play Moncala? All right, so we've got a few people. So this is a pretty easy game to learn at least how to play the basics. And so I've actually built a you know, very poor Moncala board with my kids. Uh, but then, you know, the main thing is you have a couple of slots inside where you put pieces and then you have some stuff at the end where you collect. And just so the people at home can see, we made a little storage container and whatnot. Anybody want to guess where these pieces came from? Spaceship is one. Any other sets? So some of them were from spaceships. Some of them were from Lego trains. One of them was from, I think, Lego Zerg. And so in terms of trying to find something that we could build, I think a Moncala set would be something that we could build and do a nice job of. So you know, in terms of, we made a small, you know, again, not really caring about color or anything like that. We just quickly made a little box that opens easily. Um, you know, just dots and then smooth pieces. So it comes off very easily. And then just putting you know, two circles together to make a piece. So again, you're know, very easy to do something like that. Uh, if people are trying to come up with you know, a good game to do, I think this might be an interesting set. What you would ideally want it to do, and we didn't bother doing it, is fold so that it could collapse together and make it you know, much easier to store or travel with. So that's you know, one option. Uh, how many people have, has anybody here never played backgammon? Okay, how many people have played backgammon? So this is another option. There's already Lego chests and checkers. What's nice, of course, is that's a combined set that you can do. They do this all the time. And so here would be another, I think, option. Again, it would be a giant board that closes. They've already done this with Lego chess and checkers. I've got that set. You wanna have some kind of board where you have nice triangular spikes. So you have to figure out exactly what scale do you want to do it on. Die are very easy to make. And then some kind of circle pieces. You know, the simplest would probably be you know, a circle, maybe with a smooth cap on top of it. And so I think that could be a very interesting set to make. You could easily make die, you could easily make um, a little container to roll the die. Any James Bond fans? Oh. Have you seen Octopussy? You're great backgammon scenes in that movie. So I think this would be another you know, really good option for games to make. There's a lot of people who play backgammon. Uh, this is a birthday card I made for my daughter many years ago. Uh, can anybody read what, they, what it says on it? Happy B-Day, Kayla, right? Uh, there's just no way to write happy birthday. Now, this is extremely thick. You know, can you make something like this thinner? When you open it up, there's a little board here in tic-tac-toe pieces that you can take out and play. So you know, again, you're trying to think of you know, what kind of things can you build, what can you construct? You know, this is a little bit big. You know, how thin can you make this? You know, this is the issue right now with you know, cell phones, laptops, and whatnot. You, know, you want to maintain functionality. What do you give up? How many people watch movies through some kind of streaming service? How many people listen to music through some kind of streaming service? How many people still buy DVDs, Blu-rays? Okay, we've got one person. I occasionally buy a few myself. And so in the old days, computers actually had either disk drives or CD drives, DVD drives built into them. And then eventually they moved them to external. So if you want to buy one, you can buy one. And nowadays, you know, they no longer come on the computers. 
I still have the computer I used in grad school uh, in working condition in my house. It can play the old uh, three and a half you know, floppy drives. It still runs, you know, God help me if it ever breaks down. But it's fascinating to see how the technology changes and what has to be done. Now that you don't have to have the CD, DVD, Blu-ray player, that removes a lot of the components that you need. So there's a lot of things to think about. Uh, how many people have ever played foosball? So Lego made a foosball set. And so I have bought five foosball sets. One of them, you know, my uh, kids and I have almost finished building. I have bought four more for the elementary school. Can anybody think why I bought four for the elementary school class? What might I, what I, but what might I want to do with four foosball sets? One is to have a tournament. That's a great idea, which I did not think of. What else could you do? You could make a larger set. So, you know, when you look at this, this is going to be good for maybe one-on-one -on -one action, but if you have your know, standard foosball, you should have you know, four players. Can we combine the four sets and make a giant, you know, good-sized foosball table? When we do this initially, the green field patterns are not going to be perfect. You know, don't worry about something like that. So for the people who are going to the elementary school, Lego has promised me that the sets will arrive in time. You know, I will talk to you to make sure that you know, we do get them. Uh, if not, I will just you know, give the, the, the set that I have at home right now with my kids. And so you know, we want to you know, get a sense of what the kids are interested in. I think it might be fun to try to convert this and make a real foosball table. And then you know, problem solve. You know, we've got four sets. How would we piece them together? All right, so this you know, basically brings us to 11 o'clock. I think this is a you know, good place to stop for the first day. I'll stay around to see if anybody has questions. We'll meet tomorrow again at 10 a.m. If people are interested in getting together for some breakfast or coffee tomorrow, um, say at 8 or 8.30, just to get to know each other, you know, happy to do that. I will be out of town on, uh, let me just stop recording at this point.